feeling if we've got enough people on board to start. Yeah. Okay. And people will come in, obviously, but yeah. So welcome. Uh, I'll just say I'm Evie Claire, and I um, and that's Kathy, and I think I'm going to ask Kathy to begin talking for the first slide. But um, we wanted to say that. Uh, well, I think we you know a lot about the garden. The garden on and is in Blue Hill, and we're always there every other Friday. We're going to be there again on this coming Friday. We're um, we always welcome people to drop by while we're there working. Um, you could work with us, you could learn about the plants, you could learn some plant gardening techniques from us, you could take a tour of the of the garden. And the garden is also open uh, seven days a week from dawn to dusk, so you can go anytime. There are a couple trails, there are some signs explaining some of the garden areas and also some plant ID labels that so you can see for yourself what things are. So. I'm just gonna, uh, I think you've all been to our website or else you wouldn't have been signing up. So I'm just gonna hand it over to Kathy. Okay, well, um, so welcome everybody. So we, um, we call this talk fall blooms, but we're also talking about color, fall color as well. So we thought we'd just start with um, these like photographs of the landscape in the fall and how, um, just the colors are so variable. And I particularly like the uh, photo of the mountain on the right. It just reminds me of like goldenrod in a field and how um, the greater landscape is sort of reflecting those same colors as we could even have in our garden or our yard. And then the, the photo on the left, just with the reds and browns and oranges, um, you know, those, again, those colors can be reflected in your garden. And um, so, you know, we should think about like, what about autumn is appealing to us and what, what colors from the greater landscape or forms from the greater landscape can we use and repeat in the garden? Um, because those, uh, the native plants are just gonna reflect those things. Um, and so, uh, you know, sometimes plants have different um, needs and, and we do too. So what do we want to see and how hard do we want to work to have a plant as far as like watering and, you know, if we put the plant right where it exists in nature, it's going to be a little bit easier going as far as maintenance is concerned. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's the only place that that plant will live. Mm -hmm. All right, and so um, we hope to talk about some plant combinations here as well as individual plants um, for the landscape. Okay. All right. Um, okay, I have to figure out. Okay, there we go. So I'll, um, I'll talk about red, for instance. Um, here's the color red. And um, you, a lot of you, People who drive around this area know those colors, the blueberry fields and how... Oh, no, it like, started. Hmm? I'm sorry? Oh. Yeah. So how um, blueberry fields can um, just turn that color and it's, it, you know, it doesn't even feel like the planet Earth anymore. It feels like Mars. And, um, and the other thing mm -hmm. about the garden landscapes, the landscapes in the in the fall is that things are kind of dying back. So they're, um, let's see how, to, you know, things are changing. And I actually, uh, yesterday I, I watched this film and I'm just thinking about the idea of fall because um, I saw this film by Pete Udeff and he talked about, the film starts, it's about the seasons, but it starts with fall. And I was thinking, isn't that interesting? He's starting with fall. And then I realized that, Fall is like the beginning. It's not necessarily spring. Fall is, the, is like that um, conception moment. The seeds are dropping. You know, you're entering into winter. Winter becomes like the gestation period, and these things are getting set up for the birth of spring. So I did. I did feel like this is a really important time to honor. And even as things are dying back, 
there's a, like a real amazing beauty in that and kind of a uh, structural beauty in the landscape and colors that kind of fade and morph and and things like that so in this slide we've got the blueberry field um, on the lower right there's a picture of that russet color of uh, a beech tree as it's you know in the early part of the fall but throughout the winter that beech tree leaves will just get more papery and more yellow or pale creamy white and you know continue to um, senesce throughout the winter so that you know I just feel like we can really celebrate even the dying process you know the the bare stems of the sumac above that and this that beautiful structure against the um, field that that picture even though it there's no snow on the ground that picture was taken you know in in the winter so you know I think that that's just kind of like the special time I think we should think about fall as this really special time that that starts to uh, set the tone for next year and you know and the whole cycle of that okay Kathy you want to take that Oh, on the garden bed, but we were gonna sort of divide up the talk into a couple different, like, I don't know if you want to call them habitats or management um, areas. So one would be the garden bed. Um, and we'll talk about the fields, meadows, lawns, and also woodlands, edges, and that sort of thing. So we'll start with the garden bed. So this is a photograph of a garden that we were trying to enlarge. Um, and so we, we started thinking about it about this time of the year. So you can see the Eupatorium in the back that's blooming and some Menarda back there. And so we um, decided to mulch over the winter with plastic to kill the lawn that was in front of this garden that we wanted to expand um, and we this was just the easiest thing for us but you could also use like leaves or other things to um to uh kill the grass below so we were planning to do the planting in the spring in this case um, the fall is actually a fine time to do planting and transplanting um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end on um, the conditions and what you want to look out for when you're doing that. So in, in this time of the year, we want to be thinking about maybe cutting back or not cutting back and what are the benefits of cutting back or just leaving the vegetation standing. Um, so a lot of the vegetation um, stems and things are homes for insects that are going to overwinter there either as pupa or eggs. So it's a good idea to leave as much um, standing in your garden as you can, um, simply to give the other um, creatures a chance to use that, those plants. And then the seeds are going to be available to birds and other and mice and um, other small mammals. So it's really good to just leave as much as you can. Um, however, you know, like my eupatorium is twice as tall as that, and it basically gets smashed by the win winter, you know, snow, wind, whatever. So it's. I usually don't like to leave it standing or I'll just cut it down halfway so it's a little sturdier uh, to last a little bit longer through the winter. So um, anyway, you need to just be thinking about, well, what, how much do you really need to do for fall, like putting the garden to bed and, um, and then try to, um, you know, work work around some of the things that you know you should be doing and maybe are a little inconvenient. So like um, the mulching, we like to use uh, leaves for mulch. Like if we're gonna kill the grass, it's good to leave the leaves whole, but if you want to just do regular mulching for any kind of garden bed, if you run over them a couple times with the lawnmower, it makes a really nice mulch and it breaks the leaves up so that organisms can get in there and decompose them more rapidly. And then in the spring, the nutrients that were in those leaves are going to be much more available 
um, to your plants. And not only that, but it's a good home for the microorganisms that are going to be helpful to your plants as well. So, did I miss anything? <laughs> no, I don't think you did. We'll, we'll probably get somewhere. We'll probably go around. Get, be in a different uh, slide. So, we're going to run through a few slides of different garden plants that um, are are good for the garden bed. And um, first one here is the Azuratina altissima, the white snake root. And this is a plant that um, can have a nice full amount of foliage. You can see that in the lower right uh, image. Um, it also can get a little bit taller. I think maybe if it's the conditions are right, maybe it's reaching for the sun more in the shady spot. Um, it might have a more full habit in a sunnier spot. But I think the foliage is so nice that even bef and it blooms quite late. So even when it's not blooming, it, you know, it's a nice, wonderful, nice plant to have in the garden that can be in front of something that's really tall and leggy, for instance. Um, you know, like the Eupatorium or maybe something like Monarda that has those tall stems that get quite leggy and you might want something in front of it. So um, I think this is an, a nice plant. Likes a little bit of shade and it can take just regular garden soil, doesn't need anything special. Do you see that, Kat? Okay, so I guess the next one is the bone set, the Eupatorium perfoliatum. So no, this um, in nature lives in wetlands. However, I've had really good luck with it in just my ordinary garden soil, which is like really ordinary. That like, no, I don't really add a lot of um, compost or anything like that. So it's been very happy there. So this is just just starting to bloom, maybe in the last week or so. And um, the one thing I've noticed about this plant also is that the foliage, it, it's a very interesting foliage um, with these opposite leaves that are sort of joined together, but it's, it does, seems to stay really nice. Like I, I don't see a lot of munching or anything going on on this foliage. So it is a nice plant for in more in the foreground, um, you know, nice foliage all the way to the ground. Um, and here's the Eupatorium. Kathy already talked about how tall it can get. And you can see in the picture on the right how tall it actually can get. And um, one of the strategies we use in a garden bed is to uh, cut it back maybe in June, mid-June, or a little later. When the plant is has reached about half its mature height, we'll actually cut it back halfway. So that what that does is it stunts the growth. It changes the habit of the plant a little bit. It'll make it a little fuller. It might push the bloom a little to be a little bit later. The bloom time might happen a little, maybe a few days to a week later than normal. And, um, and it also will shorten the plant. So the picture on the left shows it in a garden bed. You can see the monk's hood next to it. And you, you know that monk's hood does not get that tall. So you can see the difference um, in just, having a certain kind of strategy for managing some of the plants. And that happens to be a really late blooming monkshood too. <laughs> oh, and that is a very late blooming monkshood, yeah. yeah. So like that would be almost to fall. Yep. Okay, so um, the Asclepius tuberosa, the butterfly weed. So this is a really, um, again, uh, has sort of a mounding habit with nice full foliage. So it's good for say the front or front areas of the garden bed. And really it just keeps blooming until fall. And it is just like covered with pollinators of every single <laughs> variety. I, I feel like this, I've never seen so many on a single plant as on this, this plant. So um, we're showing it in the lower left hand photo with a, one of the liatris which is not our native Laetris. There is one that is native to me called uh, Nova Anglae. Um, that one would be interesting to find. I have not found seed available for that. I believe it likes more of a calcareous 
soil. But that color reminded me of the bee balm. And I thought if you wanted that kind of color combination, that that might be a good one. I'd put the bee balm behind it. Um, but it would give you a, that nice uh, color combination. Mm -hmm. I also just want to take a quick reference because I'm looking at this thing that says the photo by Martha Moss. And a lot of these photos, um, we have one of our volunteers in the garden is we're working on a phenology project. And so Martha has been really wonderful taking a lot of photos of the uh, plants in the native garden as they're blooming and going to seed. So we have, a re we can start a database and a record of, of that information for our um, community. And that would mean that you could, you know, know when to see something in bloom. And you could also know when to collect seed if you're interested in collecting any seed. So we'll also talk a little bit more about that, but I just got reminded of that and I wanted to put out a shout out for Martha Moss who's been doing a great job. Um, and we also have another volunteer, Kathy Kling, who's doing a lot of the um, research for the database on all the plants. So we're really pleased to have this project underway. Um, this is a picture of Verbena hostata, blue ver verbane and um, this is, I guess it might just be finished. It's sort of on its way out right now. And you can see with the uh, goldenrod that it's, you know, the way the blooms uh, go up the stem, that, that's like the end of the bloom as, as, it, as it rises up the stem like that and, um, and elongates. But I love this plant because of this sort of, I always think of a candelabra when I'm thinking about this plant. And it is also one of those wonderful uh, bright, violet, rosy violet colors that can really enhance um, a garden bed. It also um, will reseed, so it's a nice structure to leave over the winter if you'd like, and you'll find it popping up in other places. It's not a bossy plant. It can kind of pop up in a lot of, in a very sort of uh, delicate way among other plants, so it, you know, um, so it doesn't spread by roots or anything. So no. it stays in its little clump and, you know, so it's easy to manage. Right. I, <laughs> yeah. And I always like, see, it's always like a little treat to see, oh, it's there <laughs> when it shows up in the garden. Um, okay. And mine, mine tends to get pretty tall because I have a lot of shade. So it can be up to like five feet tall. Some places it's probably closer to three to four feet. Anyway, so then um, we're going to talk about some of the golden rods, some of the underappreciated um, <laughs> fall blooming plants. Um, so this one is the grass leaf golden rod, uh, Euthamia graminifolia. Just want to mention that they changed all the names, so there's only a few solidagos left. So this one is changed to Euthamia. Anyway, we like this one particularly because it has, it, first of all, it doesn't grow too tall, about three feet is about as high as it gets. And it has a really airy appearance. And um, it stays pretty much in its clump. And I feel like it's, um, you know, it's light enough that it can just be a filler and moving through the garden and looks really nice. So. And the photo on the right shows pretty much what it looks like in late, late fall um, and even into the winter sometimes um, with those uh, seed heads and which are great food for things like finches. Um, and, you know, they just kind of fly around a little, but easy to collect. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say uh, yesterday I saw a field of this and I think about the, uh, some of the golden ruts that we're a little bit nervous about because they're so aggressive. And even though this was a full field, it still had, because of that airy kind of look, it was quite lovely. It didn't have that sort of brutish look of a, you know, like the uh, rough leafed uh, golden rod or one of the other ones that kind of can take over. Um, here are a couple um, smaller golden rods and some that I'm, I would put in a garden bed. Um, you know, and the photo on the right, the gray goldenrod, um, that's actually in my yard. And it, it, I just was doing these mowing strategies and this little clump appeared uh, last year 
because I didn't mow this one area and um, or two years ago, I should say. And so I've been sort of mowing around it and looking at it and thinking about it. And it's so tidy in, to me. It just feels really tidy. And I'm thinking that this fall, I'm going to transplant some of that into a garden bed and just start experimenting more um, in my own garden and like what I can do with some of these golden rods. And the silver rod is another favorite of uh, when I see it, I'm always you know, it always puts a smile on my face. I think I like it a lot because it has that singular um, inflorescence. It doesn't branch out so much like typical golden rods. And it's a cream, often a creamy white color. And it, it can grow in pretty gravelly situations, um, soils that are not very rich at all. Probably prefers those kinds of soils. And again, it's, it's a small and uh, plant that doesn't take up a lot of room. Okay, so the downy goldenrod is, um, this one is more adapted to uh, very poor soils, like gravelly, uh, dry soils. Um, again, it has that kind of um, like, um, like singular inflorescence, like, and it just, um, kind of looks like a tail and it, it doesn't really branch out very much. But um, so it has kind of a nice um, stature to it. And so here it is growing with um, little blue stem. Again, another plant that likes it, um, likes the so poor soils, poor, dry, well-drained soils. So if you have that kind of situation, this is a nice combination. Um, I feel like the collar is a little bleached out in the photo and that golden rod is a little bit more, um, well, I guess it depends on the time of day and the time of year too, but it is a little bit brighter, I think, than it is appearing in the photo. Um, and so um, we, we just show it here in the vase with um, the, our native bee balm. Um, I believe this is a different goldenrod in here, the Canada goldenrod, maybe. No, I think that's the early one, actually. Oh, early. Okay, so that the early one is blooming now. It's called early goldenrod. Um, and so it's overlapping with the Menarda. So just from the, we can bring plants in from the larger landscape to just be appreciated um, close up in a vase. <laughs> So these are um, two other golden rods that to me don't, I don't experience like, you know, your typical golden rod. And these are ones that are often found in shady spots in kind of on, in the light, dappled light in the open woods. Um, the, uh, the one that's called blue stem golden rod, the Solidago cassia, that one is, um, shown on the top growing at the native garden that's actually growing in the sun and um, and it gets a little fuller and stronger uh, kind of like almost like a shrub a small shrub looking plant we saw photos of it of it growing in the sun um, before we planted the library garden and we thought it would be really fun to um, to um, add that to the garden and see how it grows uh, you know, to kind of as a strong plant since that's such a big landscape and we really needed it to um, fill the, the landscape with some bold shapes and bold uh, swaths of, of plants. But you can see the structure of the stem and the way the flowers grow on the stem in, in this photo down below. And then of course the photo on the left, you know, who would have guessed that that was a goldenrod? Um, it's not blooming yet. That picture was recently taken at the Native Garden, so it will be blooming in a little while. You can see how lovely that bloom is and, and the kind of delicate stature of the plant in this photo up here. Okay, so I guess we're gonna move on to the asters then. We have quite a few asters to explore too. So um, the New England aster on the left is um, this one has been um, selected and um, you can find different varieties 
um, of selections of this one in the nursery that grow in different heights and slightly different colors. But um, just in the wild, it, it's usually that purple color. Sometimes it's a little bit more pinkish than purple. But anyway, um, grows about four feet tall um, and is pretty widespread. On the right is the New York Aster. Um, this one seems to prefer a little bit more moist habitats. I often find it in wetter situations than the New England Aster. Um, I think that the photo looks a little bleached out to me. I typically see it a little bit bluer, more like the photo at the bottom mm -hmm. uh, or somewhere between the two. So in the bottom, we're just showing the, um, is that the New England Aster, Amy, do you recall? I think it is the New England and it's Martha's photo, but I'm pretty sure it's the New England Aster, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's with the roughly uh, goldenrod yeah. uh, there too. So anyway, again, another nice combination. These are sort of just our colors of the fall. So um, we just uh, mm -hmm. wanna appreciate those. I'm gonna try to move a little quicker because I looked at the time and we want time for talking or questions at the end. Um, flax leaf stiff aster is an aster that is also in that gravelly soil. As some of these photos were taken at the same sandy soil field. Um, the ones that we say are the asters from the and golden rods that we were looking at. Um, this is something I just wanted to also say that um, I know the uh, Five Star Nursery had this plant for sale in our gar in our nursery uh, plant sale in June, and um, so I'm trying it out in my garden. I think Kathy also got one, <clears throat> but it's a very short aster and. Um, hasn't started blooming yet, um, but it's also available by seed at Wild Seed, I noticed they had it in their Wild Seed catalog. So it's just, we're putting out these shout outs for, you know, you can, these are plants that are available, they're accessible, and um, we wanna just really show the very variety of, of these, um, the many asters that we have available to us. And um, so I just wanted to kind of quickly do that little shout out as well. Yeah, and things like the New York and the New England Aster are so common, they're very easy to transplant. And we'll talk a little bit more about that too. So if you have it someplace else on the property and you just wanna get it into your garden bed, it's, it's very easy to do. So this is the Smooth Aster. Um, this, it just has a very smooth leaf the photo on the lower right is a photo of the leaf. Um, I find it to be a little bit bluer in real life than maybe that photo is showing. So it has sort of a little bit of a contrasting foliage. And again, on the left, it is obviously a nectar source for the monarch butterfly, but also um, the flower uh, spray is a lot more open um, if it's getting a little bit less sun in that photo in the middle is, is kind of like a really, I mean, I've never seen it that dense, um, <laughs> but it would be nice in a garden. Yeah. Um, this flat top aster is also, a, a, I think, a really lovely plant. I often put it in a vase when it's growing. It's pretty um, widespread. I, it's in my lawn, field, meadow, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I, one of the things I like so much about it is that reddish stem. It's a really lovely kind of contrast to the leaf color and the, and the white flowers. I, I just think it's kind of a nice plant in general. I also noticed that it's one, another one of those plants that can get kind of, kind of tall, but also really easily shortened with that strategy that I mentioned before, um, you know, with the, Eupator, the, the Joe Pie weed. And um, so again, if you wanna put it in a garden bed and you wanna kind of manipulate the height it's gonna be, you have that option, or you could put it in and let it stand really tall and be in the background and rise above other plants. That one is a little clonal, so you, know, you do have to kind of watch it a little bit. <laughs> so uh, next is the, uh, heart-leaved aster or the blue wood aster. 
Um, this is just a really, really pretty aster and barely seems adaptable. Shade, sun, it doesn't matter. It does tend to seed a lot, I've noticed in my garden. Um, so that's information. If you need a lot to cover a lot of ground, that this is a good one. And I'll just mention here too, like if you're not mulching your garden with ground up leaves or, or other materials that a lot of our natives will seed around. Um, but that's not really um, unusual. I mean, a lot of garden plants seed around too. Um, it's, it's that we tend to maybe not maintain our native plants the same way we maintain our typical garden plants by deadheading or cutting back in the fall. So um, I think they get an undeserved bad reputation for you know seeding around or being a little bit bossy. Um, they're really just adapted to cover any empty spaces in the garden. And so we have to kind of appreciate the tenacity and the adaptability of, of these plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is the, um, a, a, um, the large leaf aster, which is kind of similar looking to the cordifolia, the other one Kathy just talked about. And we'll show a slide showing all three and you can, uh, three of the asters that have that similar look. The difference I find is that I think it blooms a little bit earlier and um, it tends not to have such a spray on top. And the, there's a uh, kind of more of a ground cover aspect to the leaves. Um, the leaves are also a little bit, can often be a little bit bigger. So you're seeing it in um, kind of in the shade. And um, this is a where it doesn't always bloom or bloom consistently or some parts of the, the clone, it's a clonal uh, mass of leaves so they do spread again by roots and um, I think it reseeds pretty easily as well. Um, maybe um, not as, as yeah, strong. I think it does and but definitely it has um, the ability to cover a lot of ground as a ground cover. Yeah. I think that's its real value for me. Mm -hmm. um, okay so here's the three uh, different asters so as like a little comparison. So with a uh, the white wood aster in the upper left. So um, again, it's a wood aster, so it's going to have a really delicate appearance because it's normally grown in the shade, normally grows in the shade. Notice the um, fewer rays on the flower, like fewer petals. So it has a little bit of a delicate, a very delicate appearance. And then um, sort of intermediate to that is the largely faster with a spray that you know, it's um, fairly open and fewer, uh, a few more rays than the wood aster and then the heart leaf aster at the bottom, which is the most densely flowered um, of the three. And the other thing to note is just, you're not likely to see the white wood aster in our area. It's not, as, it's not very common up here in this part of Maine. So if you're looking in the, right. If you're out on the, in the woods and looking at um, things that you're trying to figure out what they are, it's probably not going to be the white wood aster. It might be one of the other two. If you're right. trying to figure that out. Um, the world aster is also another very common uh, little aster that you'll see in the woods and um, called world because of the way the leaf is whirling around the stem like that. Um, both Kathy and I were remarking on this photo that I found where it's kind of acting like a ground cover there. It's not typically seen like that in the woods that around here at least. Um, but again, it gives an idea of how to pretend to possibly use it in your landscape um, and kind of create a ground cover out of it um, in, a, in a spot in your landscape. So we're moving into the lawns. Okay, so um... Um, I just wanted to talk about like lawns and meadows and you know it just seems like we have so much lawn and people are always mowing it and I just think it seems like a really huge use of resources um, where if we could just devote some of our lawns to be to be in um, meadow areas or more wild areas um, we could be doing a lot 
for leaving sea nectar sources and habitat for nesting birds. So you can um, think about the pattern that you mow and maybe um, change your pattern from year to year to sort of get some different um, effects on the landscape. Um, and that way you're you're keeping a lot of habitat and a lot of nectar and seed available for the other creatures and and you're keeping and then if you keep changing it every year you can mow other places that will um, um, be mowing any kind of woodies that might be wanting to invade. The other thing I learned about mowing and I, I realized I was doing this incorrectly the other day that you should start from the center and mow out from the center rather than starting on the outside and mowing in because if you start at the center it gives a lot more space for animals um, and insects to move so they don't get um, you know it, they don't intersect with the blades of the mower. I, a little snake was like trying to get away and I thought, oh, that's horrible. So anyway, you see frogs, snakes, insects, whatever. So try to think about starting in the center and moving outward and then maybe not mowing everything. And then if you have a big meadow, the timing is important. You know, it's good to, if you want to like avoid any kind of ground nesting birds like a bobolink or savannah sparrow, you should be mowing like now would be the earliest you would want to mow. And if you want to like leave some habitat for the pollinators, like I used to keep bees and it got me thinking about this a lot, like all the, these fields are mown and that it, there is no nectar left for the bees. I mean, those were cultivated bees, but there's plenty of native bees that need nectar sources as well. So just think about leaving a little bit more and, uh, for them. And then the last thing was the effects. Um, if you mow all the time, you're gonna be encouraging the European grasses and plants because our native grasses and plants have not evolved with um, grazing animals. So if the more you mow, the more non-native plants you're gonna get. The less you mow, the more native plants you're gonna get. So just keep that in mind too. And, um, you know, so try to mow less, try to mow later. I think if you mow once every three years, it'll probably be fine. Um, you'll still be able to um, get through the meadow with your, with whatever mower you have. If you have a problem, like a lot of invasive, woody invasives that you want to get rid of, then maybe you want to mow every year. But in any case, um, be thinking about those things when you're, um, changing over lawn into meadow or just managing an existing meadow. So I wanted to show this photo because um, not everybody has a big field that, you know, like the photos from before. And this is um, just a small uh, little yard. It's actually my yard. And, um, and then a few years ago, I started mowing um, just paths through it where I wanted to walk. And all these wonderful things started popping up. And, you know, I, I think about the shapes that I'm mowing. So for instance, in this, you can see the, the, the shapes of the actual garden bed and relating to the shape of that open, that unmowed spot in the, in the center of that photo. Um, the other thing I just wanna say is this picture was taken just a few days ago, right after two weeks of hot, hot, dry, dry weather. And my lawn always looks this green. And so I just, um, <laughs> because I don't mow very often lawn. and, um, and, and, you know, it's just, that's unusual, you know, for this time of year to see a lawn this green. So uh, no, no watering, no, um, no uh, fertilizing, nothing, just, uh, mm -hmm very little mowing. All right, so here's just um, a, a meadow showing that, I, this is probably the gray goldenrod and the silver rod because those, or it could be the early goldenrod. Oh, I think it's the downy. And the silk, either, well, and the silver the, rod is. Oh, okay. I thought the yellow was the downy. 
It could be the downy too. They all have that similar shape. Anyway, just uh, with mixed with the grasses at this moment in time, it just is a really beautiful um, scene. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then here's uh, one of the grasses that uh, are one of our native grasses that can be a part of a meadow. Um, we also want to show in the picture on the left that just the idea of grasses in in the um, plants in a garden bed sort of brings that notion of meadow into the into the garden bed. So it's kind of you know sort of just bringing that idea of meadow and the the way one plants with drifts and adding those kinds of grasses and the and the um, I think there's like a meadow like uh, I'm trying to think of the word, but you know, just bringing the idea of meadow into your garden bed. That's what I guess what I'm trying to say here. And I feel like grasses can be a great um, addition to a, to any garden bed because they just have that vertical presence and they can look, um, they just give a change in texture and color that uh, other herbaceous plants don't. So the Soft thrush, this is Juncus effusus. This is a very vertical, it's a rush, so it's round, but it has this interesting seed head that comes out of the side of the uh, spiky blade. So on the right, this is a photograph I just took. So you can see that how they've kind of browned up and you get this like brown and green combination. And in this case, there's um, sensitive fern in the background, which kind of highlights it. But the thing about this rush is it, does, it kind of grows out anywhere. And um, it, but the nice thing about it, I mean, normally it's in wetlands, but I've seen it growing in a lot of really dry situations too. It's a colonizer. So if you have some empty space, it might just but you might just find it there. Um, but it stays in this nice, neat clump that you can see on the left. So I feel like that for a garden bed, I think those clumps are very nice. And, and it could even be like in a whole line as a very um, uh, like minimalist kind of, uh, you know, composition. So anyway, um, this is a nice one to try. And I think this is one you can find pretty much anywhere and transplant it into your garden. And I think you can buy plugs as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is the little blue stem, which is one of my favorite grasses. I always love this time of year because of, of that beautiful little downy, airy, feathery um, seed head. And um, it is about, uh, I'd say it's about, it gets about waist high um, when in, um, and it also likes that gravelly dry, uh, dry soil. You often see it on the sides of the road when you're um, driving around. Um, another, it also can be purchased in seed and added to any meadow mix. Okay, so the foxtail barley, this is an annual grass. I think we have to speed it up, baby. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so anyway, this just has such a beautiful seed head. Um, there are cultivars out there that are a little bit more pink, but it does tend to have a pinkish hue to the head. And so um, there aren't that many annuals, and I think this is a good one, especially if you just want to have uh, some instant uh, gratification in an area that you're planning for some other purpose later on. Okay, woodland edges and vines. So we're gonna um, kind of flip through this really quickly. These are, here's a beautiful photo of a, a woodland walk with the colors of the fall. And so basically when it comes to the edges and the, the woods, we think a lot about the editing and the pruning and you know just how to create spaces to have views in and, um, and and just shaping it through that kind of editing pruning process. And of course, it's also important to think about the deer protection when you're planting close to the woods. Yeah. Okay, so this this photo, I just, this is one by, that Martha Moss had taken and I just feel like this photo just like 
is like a wow situation for me. <laughs> and so these are probably sedges. I, since I wasn't there, I don't know, but they look to me like those are sedges planted. And so at this moment in time, everything's coming together. And I, I just want to point out that why, why don't we plant for this moment in time? I mean, we plant our peonies or whatever for the three weeks that they're blooming in the spring. You know, we devote a lot of garden space to some of these things. And so why don't we devote some garden space to the things that are really going to show off like this in the fall. So between those birches and the poplars and the um, sedges, I just think this is fabulous. Great. And here's another view of another fabulous kind of woodland edge with the sugar maples um, and the winterberry in this picture. I, I'm not sure about the timing, but they're already the leaves have already dropped on the winterberry and um, and the ma sugar maples are in full blaze. Um, I think there's also some poplar in that on the left side in this photo. So we're okay, gonna, so we're some gonna... shrubs that have like really, oh sorry, did you go ahead? No, you go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, that we're gonna go through a couple of shrubs that have really amazing fall color and some other things. So this is the hollow bush and um, the fruits are on the left. So they start out green, they turn red, and then they turn black when they're ripe. And that's when you wanna harvest them if you wanna try to grow this plant from seed. Um, and I just wanted to point out that there are some great resources out there like the William Kalina Trees and Shrubs book that give a lot of information about how to propagate um, things from seed. And so anyway, on the right then, here it is in one of its many fall colors. So it turns an amazing range of colors, everything from pink to deep purple, all like week by week changes. <laughs> and it's another uh, viburnum just, uh, or two actually in this photo. Um, the viburnum nudum is the wild raisin and that you can see on the lower left photo how those fruits turn a lot of, have a variety of color as they're turning as well. And, and that's actually quite impressive to watch, you know, that happening. Um, just pointing out the little picture on the lower, in the middle there. Um, this is a plant that we see a lot in the woods, just growing and not the shrubs. And Kathy has a theory that the deer are eating it before it gets to be big. Um, so, and that's very likely, but we, I always think that it's available um, if you find it in your woods or along on an edge, you, there's a perfect opportunity to transplant a small little plant like that. So it's good to recognize some of these uh, shrubs when they are young, if you want to think about transplanting them into your garden. And again, the beautiful uh, fall foliage of, of all of these is, is another reason to plant them in your home landscape. Okay, so this is more about the herbaceous things in the woods. So we have the aster uh, cordifolia, the heartleaf aster, and the cinnamon fern, and um, bunchberry. Um, so the this is like a little opening in the woods, and um, it just gives an, a, a nice edge to this path. There's a lot to see. It changes week to week, and um, it, um, it, it, it's, this is a well-tended area. It is actually a garden. So you can have this too. All you have to do is change over some of that lawn <laughs> or plant some things on the edge of the woods. <laughs> and here's uh, some, uh, some more shrubs, smaller shrubs, um, the Rhodora, which you'll find more likely find in wetter areas and the Sweet fern, which you'll find in probably gravelly, drier, disturbed soils, especially on the edges of the roads. But here, you know, are some unusual colors for these two plants, and that's what happens in the fall. Okay, so then the staghorn sumac. This is a nice plant um, for like a kind of instant lushness because it grows really fast. Um, the upper photo is what it looks like now. The lower photo is how it's going to look in probably a week. <laughs> and, um, it happens pretty fast. 
And then the photo that Amy showed in the beginning with just the fruits left on the ends of the stems, how it looks in the winter. So um, this is a really nice plant for, for the edges. It's a good plant for a screen and um, it has a lot to offer for wildlife too. Yeah, great. Um, the chokeberry, another wonderful plant. It blooms early spring, so the berries show up in the summer and you can see that they're there with the leaves in high summer with the green leaves there on the lower right. But they, um, if the birds haven't eaten them yet or if you haven't collected them because they are, I have had delicious chokeberry syrup um, out of these berries. Um, you can, so they're easily harvested and you can see that those berries are, stay around for a while and while, and the, you know, while the leaves are turning bright red in the fall. Okay, and then the summer sweet. This is um, this shrub. It's, it's hard to find the straight species available in the nursery, but um, there are a lot of varieties and selections and cultivars available. But this thing is like covered with insects, so it's a wonderful pollen source or nectar source um, that's blooming. Just well, mine's just starting to bloom because it's in the woods, but it's probably blooming more uh, prolifically in the sun already. Anyway, smells delicious. Yeah, <laughs> worth every penny. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kathy, you, I'm gonna you since you took this picture, I'm gonna let you tell yeah. the story of this. Yeah, so I took this picture of the button bush. This is at Pam Johnson's old garden. If anybody knows Pam, and this is pretty much looking at eye level. So she had a button bush that I mean, it's like ten feet tall, and it's um, the lower limbs are gone so it's sort of shaped like a vase like a tree and it's just so lovely this is the ostrich ostrich fern growing below it which is probably about four feet tall itself so anyway this was just a really nice combination uh, in a really shady moist area in her garden and uh just another uh picture of what our fall looks like in the in our landscape just on the edges of the woods, there's huckleberry burning red in the foreground. I don't know why anybody would plant the burning bush, that invasive uh, anonymous. When we have plants like this that we can add to our landscape. Yeah. Yeah. And plants like th this one, the um, Virginia rose. <laughs> Anyway, just, just these color combinations. Uh, this is a bracken fern that's gone by, that's right behind it. So just this lovely foliage stays this mahogany color and the stems stay this red color all winter. The hips stay a nice, they turn out even darker, more like the color of the leaves in the winter. So this is just a, one of our wonderful native roses. Um, and this is the, groundnut, Apios Americana. Um, this actually just volunteered at my house, um, right mm -hmm. at the rail of my deck. Like why, how it just knew to go there, I don't know. And I was so excited when it showed up because um, it was in the perfect spot. And of course, I just want to warn you that after some years of, it always comes back on that rail, but it has been creeping around in my garden. So it winds around some plants, some tall plants. Sometimes it acts like a stake on the plants, keeps them upright. And so it can have a function that way. <laughs> <laughs> and the smell is wonderful. Um, I smell it every day I walk into my house and it's a little bit like paper whites, but it's outside, so I don't mind it. It's really uh, aromatic. So, um, and it was a food source. Uh, the ground nuts are actually a food source. So it's harvestable. Uh, yeah, for people. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is the virgin's bower, the, our native clematis. Anyway, it just has this, it blooms now. I mean, well, actually the upper right hand photo I just took last this week. So it's just budded up, ready to bloom. So it'll look like that in the lower. And then the left hand photo, this is how it looks after blooming. So it's really at its um, moment right now and having its, um, its, uh, its time of beauty, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a, an annual vine that we have in our landscape that will reseed and kind of pop up. Um, and the one on the 
photo on the right, uh, Kathy took at Pam's garden the other day as well. And you can see how it climbs um, the way that I love these little spiraling, coiling tendrils. They're just so lovely. And it's climbing up a, is that a sweet Sicily you said, Kathy? Yeah. So the, those stalks are, 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 have gone by now. So they're just kind of looking dead in the landscape, but then they become an armature for something like this. And um, so again, they want on at my deck, it's just popping up. <laughs> so here we are, we're getting to the end. Uh, Kath, you wanna start talking? Okay, so um, anyway, so the fall is a great time. To, so you should start thinking about what you wanna accomplish um, right now that as the temperatures cool down, like just today even felt cool. But anyway, starting, um, you know, mid-September or even even now, now. Spring, as long as we're getting regular rain mm -hmm. um, you can start um, planting or transplanting um, from one area to the other. Um, the, the soil temperature is still warm so this is the time when as plants the nest they are bringing the nutrients from the leaves back into the roots so there's a lot of root growth going on and that will take place as long as there's um, um, leaves and stems to, to withdraw nutrients from and so the warm temperatures of the soil will really help the plant um, store those things and be ready for next year so also um, and that will also help it root into the ground and help it um, survive some of the freezing and thawing that we are so likely to have. Then the plants will be ready to just like get going in the spring. And this is also a perfect time to be um, collecting seeds that you can sow um, immediately and just wait for them to germinate, having that um, cold period of the winter, a natural conditioning period. Um, so the cons for the um, for doing this now is that it uh, timing can be a little tricky and so um, if you have new seedlings you, or if you could risk having them get you know frosted the fr uh, early frost could nip them it's a little bit unpredictable to make a plan to do a big garden project in the fall you know sometimes the rain just comes and doesn't stop and then you're working in mud but um, so that's just a, a sometimes a risk that happens it's typical that uh, a newly planted especially perennial in the in a garden bed in the fall will have a more likeliness to heave in the winter frost and thaws that we have in our winters but you can mulch it and kind of help mitigate that potential of it doing that and um i think you know there aren't enough cons i don't think to um say that fall is not a great time to be planting a garden or renovating a garden transplanting things i always use the time this time because i've just it's close to the summer I have that information of what just happened in my garden and what I wanted what changes I want to see so it's a really good moment to just with that memory you know just go for it and and uh, kind of gives a, a boost to the end towards the end of the summer I think we're uh, we have one more slide <laughs> and just this our is favorite, our favorite. <laughs> we saved it for the last this is uh when we see this we always go ah! <laughs> because of that color of those berries um so this one the mountain holly i'm just going to mention again this is the one that's like uh, it's everywhere in the woods you look for that purple petiole and the petiole is the thing that connects the leaf right, to the stem right there see how purple that color is you can find them like three inches tall in the woods just protect it or move it or whatever but um and then maybe in 10 years you're gonna have those berries <laughs> it'll be worth it it'll be so worth it yeah um so we have i'm just gonna open up this chat the uh, wait i have to figure out how to do this can you read I don't know we, have a lot of questions. we have a few questions i'm mow my field only after lupin have seeded 
a gonta sheet, I guess. Have milkweed at edge of fields so that I'm just not quite sure what the question is. I think these were just um, people were just talking back and forth oh. while we were talking. Oh, so I see. If there's anybody who would like to ask a question, you can put it in the chat or you could unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, Hi, I have a quick question. Okay. I'm looking for a Karinga Shoma alternative. I just proposed it for the first time in a garden and the homeowner liked that leaf texture is real cool. And I don't know if you knew a native alternative. Thanks. Okay. And for Karinga Shoma, hmm. Well, what about a pink flower? I was thinking of um, flowering raspberry. Oh, that's a great choice. It has a similar leaf. Well, not really similar. It's a shrub. But it does have a wide leaf like that, but it has a pink flower, which um, was, I still saw it, it was still blooming in Pam's garden when I was there the other day. Yeah. But one, um, we don't have that many things with large leaves like that. Right. It is, it's a, that crink, the raspberry will be a little more invasive, or a little spread more quickly than the Karingashoma would. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if, in terms of, so it's really about the leaf. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe if we think about also it, the shade. Yeah. Uh. Just, yeah. Leaf texture and shade, really. Shade. Also the shade. Okay. I think that's a. You've answered the question beautifully. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting us off the hook. Um, <laughs> uh, I read somewhere that Canada goldenrod is to be avoided. Yeah. I guess I would do that. I would avoid it. Um, do you, what do you think, Kathy? Can I go? Oh, right. Well, that would that one would be fine in a field where you um, don't mind. It has a lot of room to move around. It is clonal, so it can take up big areas. Um, I believe that was the one with the blue uh, vervain, and in that situation, the grassland golden rod was growing with it. And it actually was really pretty to have those two levels of the golden rod and then the blue vervain above it. Um, but I would not put it in a garden bed, no. Right, and, and it well really a lot. So I would deadhead it if, if you had it in, in a place that you're deadheading or mow it or something. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the, this talk will be is being recorded and we're gonna post it on our, we have a YouTube channel. So when we do post it, we'll have a link to that that we'll mail out to our mailing list. Okay, and then the million dollar question, where can we get seeds or plants? So the, you can get seeds through the Wild Seed Project. You can collect them yourself. You can come to the Native Garden on a Friday when we're working and collect them there. Um, you can just collect them from the roadside. Uh, plants are a little bit more difficult this time of year. I believe that Honey Petal Nursery in Belfast is still open. Um, but uh, as far as a retail situation, you do have to make an appointment. Um, but I believe that most of the other places we typically get plants are not really, don't really have a retail presence. Um, we do have a plant sale every June, first week in June, and you can get a lot of plants we just talked about there. Okay. I don't see any more questions. I don't think we missed anybody. So it's eight, a little after eight, and uh, we said we would end at eight. So I think um, feel free to email us if you do have a question lingering that you didn't um, think of today, and um, we'll try to get back to you. And thank you.